Hello and welcome to Hunter's Point in Long Island City Through the Ages, Chapter 4 of 5. This is a five-part historical journey through maps, paintings, and photographs uh, hosted by the Hunter's Point Parks Conservancy with our guide, Andrew Capuchinis, a local resident uh, and member of the New York Map Society, as well as an amateur historian. And uh, if you haven't checked out videos one through three yet, check them out on our YouTube channel, Hunter's Point Parks Conservancy. Um, but this is chapter four, 20th century development and decline. Uh, so we're gonna be learning about the 20th century in LIC today. So Andrew, take it away. Well, thank you and uh, welcome to everyone who's uh, going to be participating today. Uh, I hope you enjoy this presentation. I'm going to start right off with the fact that the uh, population in Queens exploded, uh, increased nearly 15 fold in the 20th century with the biggest decade to decade increases um, in the years from 1900 to 1930, where from 1920 to 30, it increased 130%. So what happened? What was responsible for that? And in this presentation, I'll be talking about uh, the presence of trolleys uh, facilitating uh, movement by business commuters, uh, erection of a bridge from Manhattan to Long Island City, and then trains, subway, and auto tunnels to Manhattan. And then I'll be getting into the fact that all Queens addresses were changed in the 1920s and why. Um, Newtown Creek environmental problems leading to community activism. And finally, East River residential and park development. As a baseline, I'm showing you uh, a 1903 map of the Hunters Point area where you can see that in the southernmost part on the left, you've got industry, you've got sugar refineries, uh, you've got uh, lumber yards, and higher up, all the way up as up to Annabelle Basin, you've got Standard Oil uh, having a major presence in Hunter's Point. So first up, trolleys, how they helped develop Hunter's Point South as the destination from all of Queens and Long Island to ferries in Manhattan. It's a photo from 1903 of the New York and Queens County Jackson Avenue line. There were some over 30 trolley lines service in Queens, all private companies multiple lines ran on Jackson Avenue. And if that 1910 photo uh, looks familiar, it was crowded then. And the number seven line, of course, is crowded now at rush hour. The first electric trolleys, by the way, replacing horse-drawn and then steam-powered trolleys began running in the early 20th century. Here's a photo of 1905, the Vernon Avenue Bridge, which carried trolleys, cars, and people over Newtown Creek. And it opened to allow ships to pass through. It was finally demolished in 1954 and replaced by the higher Pulaski Bridge uh, further east. And this 1931 photograph of Vernon Boulevard at 50th Avenue. I've put a couple of red um, uh, highlight areas. One, uh, you can see uh, the entrance to the number seven line uh, right there. You see, you also see the absence of the other entrance that would have been on uh, Vernon Avenue in the future. And you also see that it's labeled Vernon Avenue north at 50th Avenue and in parentheses 4th Street. And that uh, is the result of that address change um, episode in the 1920s. Now trolleys were really efficient. 
and and why did they decline? It took auto and bus manufacturers buying up those private trolley lines, and then later intentionally abandoning them in favor of bus routes in the late 1930s. Almost all of them shut down in 1937. And the Hunters Point Ferry Terminal at the foot of Borden Avenue, which was opened in, 19, in 1858, was uh, no longer Queens commuters' destination. Now it was Manhattan. Even so, some trolley lines persisted as late as 1957. Until 1954, in fact, the Welfare Island stop on the Queensboro Bridge trolley was the only way to get there. I remember taking the Queensboro trolley from Queens Plaza to 2nd Avenue and 59th Street and then walking to Central Park with my parents. And I remember that I got to put a nickel in the slot. Next, we're going to Bridges, which helped develop Queens Plaza and the rest of Queens. It didn't help Hunter's Point. It was under construction from 1903 to 1909 and originally called the Blackwell's Island Bridge, but by the time it opened, it had already been named, renamed the Queensboro Bridge. And of course, now it's the Ed Koch Bridge. So they were talking about putting up a bridge from Manhattan to Long Island City as early as 1838, but nothing ever happened until there was a creation of the Department of Bridges for New York City in 1902. And if this bridge reminds you of another one, it was designed by the same folks who designed the Williamsburg Bridge, which opened in 1903. Here's another view from the Long Island City side of the Queensboro Bridge under construction in 1908. And you can see there was basically zero development in uh, the area of Long Island City, uh, right up to the shore. And of course the shore was industrial, but beyond that, there was pretty much nothing. That's an amazing photo. It's, it's just insane seeing that uh what it is now i actually can see the queensboro ridge from where i'm sitting in my apartment and a uh, much different much different view out the window today one house that's amazing or two i guess in june 1909 it was uh, a big a big deal it was the opening of the fourth longest bridge in the world at the time big news for all of new york city and uh, certainly for Long Island City, but now you had Queensboro Plaza as a major uh, point for development. And here you can see it in a couple of photos, the uh, leading up to uh, Queens Plaza. And again, you can see that there is virtually no development right up to the water. And then at Bridge Plaza North, you already see uh, commercial buildings. Uh, not much traffic, but um, this, that was the whole point of the bridge, is to try and develop the rest of Queens. Then train, trolley, and subway tunnels spark development in Astoria and Eastern Queens, but again, it diminished the need for the ferries at Hunter's Point. Now, railroads couldn't go from New Jersey to Long Island, so they put boxcars on floats in New Jersey and uh, maneuvered them over to Long Island City and also Brooklyn, and they were unloaded by gantries in, uh, that could handle 100-ton cars. Uh, the two gantries that survive in Gantry Plaza State Park were originally built in 1904. They are rebuilt in 1925. And you see that leading up to the gantries, there was nothing but train tracks. East River rail tunnels made them unnecessary. All of a sudden, you could go right 
under Manhattan, basically, to Long Island. Do you know why they needed to be rebuilt? Were they damaged in some way? I, I didn't see any information in that regard, uh, only that they needed to be rebuilt. I, my guess is uh, that they needed to make them more sturdy. Uh, one of the design features of these new gantries is how uh, easily and quickly they could move up to these 100-ton boxcars. Yeah. And uh, I believe they were last used sometime in the 60s, um, but are still you know, there and present in Gentry Plaza State Park as a callback to these times and an iconic viewpoint for uh, our neighborhood. Right. A little bit of history here. Um, Westbound's trains in Long Island on the Long Island Railroad ran to, they had a terminal at Hunter's Point, and that's where passengers took ferries across the East River to Manhattan's 34th Street Ferry Terminal. 1904, work started on an East River tunnel to Long Island City, and in 1910, uh, tubes opened from the Hunter's Point Terminal to a brand new Penn Station. And that was really a death blow to all the business that Hunters Point had been uh, having from commuters uh, coming from Long Island. People who were stopped in a bar, stopped in a restaurant, maybe stopped overnight in a hotel in order to take a ferry the next day. So 6.3 million passengers used the Long Island City Station to go to ferries in 1910. By 1915, it was 1.1 million. By 1916, the Hunters Point subway station opened, connecting to Vernon Jackson, which, and then to Grand Central. Only 63 commuters a day were using the Long Island City Station. I remember I went to high school in Manhattan and I took a bus from Maspeth that went to the Hunters Point subway station. And I used to see people coming off the Long Island Railroad trains coming up to the subway. And this was in the early 60s, were not a lot of people using it even then. So 19, by 1925, they just shut down the ferries and the Hunters Point neighborhood uh, went more and more commercial and more and more businesses were abandoned and closed. Tunnels, 1892, there was construction started, funded by William Signway, the son of the founder of the piano company on tubes that uh, they intended, the Steinway family intended to uh, go up to Astoria and develop the real estate that the Steinway uh, family owned. It was meant to be a trolley from uh, Manhattan to Astoria. But by 1896, accidents and then William Steinway's death uh, derailed construction, pardon me for that. By 1902, uh, the owner of the Interborough Rapid Transit Company, August Belmont, bought the tunnel. He reconfigured it for trolley service between Grand Central and Vernon Avenue. It was going to be a single stop on a loop. And you see on the upper right the final plan for the trolley. And you notice I put a circle, a red circle, on uh, where the line deviated from uh, 4th Street uh, now 50th Avenue, and it kind of made a little curve to go across the East River. Anybody who's walked down 50th Avenue to the park or to the train station may have noticed that the new uh, ventilation tunnel that they built next to the old one is kind of a little bit askew. It's not parallel to 50th, and that's because it happened, it's being built right at that curve where the subway actually turns and crosses the East River. And at the center of the East River, uh, and 
everybody talked about a complicated geology for uh, digging that tube. There was a, a bit of a rise in the middle of the river. And you see below that, uh, they took excavated uh, earth and stone from that tunnel and they piled it on top of what had been underwater, a bit of a, a mount there, uh, and created essentially an artificial island, which for many years was called Belmont Island. And it's what you see from across the park, looking at Manhattan towards the, the UN building. And if you may, have, you may have noticed this, some structures on Belmont Island, and those are not commercial or mechanical useful structures. Those are Buddhist symbols because um, a, a nonprofit group uh, got the right to rename Belmont Island Utant Island after a director of the UN. And those are Buddhist symbols. The first trolley wow. passage through these tubes was in 1907 and things stopped. There was a fire in the tunnel. Nothing happened for years and then New York City bought the tunnel for a planned flushing line. And by 1915, the first subway train made it to the Vernon Jackson stop. The, until the flushing number seven line, subways were built to reach populated area, but this flushing line was built specifically to encourage development in Queens. And this is the uh, 33rd Rawson Street stop, and you see basically nothing anywhere around there. And this is what the line looked like right into Eastern Queens, going to another populated area, maybe Roosevelt Avenue and Broadway, and eventually the Main Street. Uh, the tubes from Manhattan, and remember how old they were and why they were built originally. They were built for trolleys. They were tiny compared to subway tunnels that were built later. So it's always, they've always been a problem. In 71, a, a train actually got stuck in the heart of the tunnel and a passenger died. A few years later, a fire broke out on a train in the tunnel, killing a passenger, trapping over a thousand people in the middle of the tunnel under the East River. In 91, there was a water main break in Manhattan and the tubes flooded to eight feet deep. In 92, there was electrical fire in the tunnel that melted several feet of iron track. And you'll see there were more problems going into the 21st century, specifically from Hurricane Sandy, which led to that recent building of a, a new ventilation shaft. Are, these still, are those still the same tubes that are in, in use now, though, then? Or did they... They're pre dig or? after the turn of the century, they uh, they did a major rebuilding of the tubes. Uh, oh, but good. It, you know, not I mean, for about 20, 30 years, they were having problems. It took Hurricane Sandy to be the straw that broke the back of the MTA uh, to actually get them to uh, fix the tunnel so that they were less prone to flooding and getting trains stuck in them. Well, that sounds terrifying. <laughs> it's not something you want to be thinking of as you're riding that train, believe me. So again, I'm showing you the 1903 Belcher Hyde map of the uh, southernmost part of Hunter's Point. And we're going just 16 years later, 1919, and what you see in the, um, the blue box that I've got up there, you now have a, a dotted line for the, uh, that number seven uh, train tunnel. You see the different paths of the, of the train tracks right next to it. 
you see dotted lines below that uh, for the, the train tunnels that were built below uh, Borden Avenue. But on both maps, you do see the Vernon Avenue Bridge. You also still see the, uh, the New York Sugar Refinery uh, taking up a major part of uh, what would become the most recently developed part of uh, Hunter's Point South. 1936 to 1940, um, they started work on the Queens Midtown Tunnel. This was part of a, um, an overall city uh, plan promoted by Robert Moses. And originally the Queens Midtown Tunnel was supposed to be uh, connected to the Lincoln Tunnel. And for anyone who does that drive to uh, New Jersey through Manhattan. I think everybody knows that you go across on 37th Street to go into the Lincoln Tunnel. You go back on 36th Street. That was originally meant to be either an above ground or below ground highway to zip across Manhattan. And because of community uh, activism, uh, that uh, possibility was canned was also meant to be part of a, a larger uh, development connecting to the Triborough Bridge and the creation of the Brooklyn Queens Expressway so that you could go uh, from Manhattan through this tunnel onto the Loyal Expressway north on the Brooklyn Queens and go up into Upper Manhattan and the Bronx. FDR happened to be the first person to drive through the tunnel and a million vehicles passed through in the first three months, but that was still fewer than expected because the East River bridges were free and still are. And I've got two photographs here. Uh, St. Raphael's built uh, 1887 at Greenpoint at Hunters Avenue, 1938 where Greenpoint Avenue just ran straight through. Two years later, the, uh, the Loyal Expressway was down below. A little personal uh, memento, this is where I had my first communion. I lived two blocks away on Greenpoint Avenue. Wow. So was there always a toll on the Queens Midtown Tunnel, even since it was Absolutely. Open? Absolutely, and every every once in a while they talk about putting in tolls on, on the bridges hasn't happened yet. Yeah, they keep raising that toll on the tunnel too. It's painful, but you you kind of you hardly realize it if you've got an easy pass. Yeah, it's amazing how much it costs them. So all Queens addresses were changed in the 1920s. And I'm going to give you a contrary point of view. I actually have two patents for uh, processing addresses, one for domestic addresses and one for uh, non-US addresses. And it's a process uh, being used by everyone from Microsoft, American Express, Google, Bank of America. So I'm, uh, I have this point of view, not just as a crank, but from someone who worked with the Postal Service for 20 years and actually had to train Postal Service marketers how to use their own processes uh, to uh, correct their marketing files. So there's a great online explanation called Organization of Queens, New York Streets done by Steve Morse that says, many of the small communities had their own street names for a thoroughfare that actually would traverse a number of urban areas. And because of problems with the system in a rapidly growing area, a massive renaming, renumbering project occurred in the 10s and 20s. I haven't seen any map older than about 1925 that has the, the new addresses replacing the old alphabetical street names with a grid of numerical streets and avenues. So this is a project launched, launched by Queens County bureaucrats 
who hired an engineer, not uh, an address expert, not someone who knew anything about real estate development in 1911. Did it accomplish its goals? I don't think so. I think this was a pipe dream by the same people who, if you remember in the last episode, published a map in 1903 saying Ward 1, formerly Long Island City. Their dream was that everyone would consider themselves Queens residents and that these old uh, names for uh, localities within Queens would disappear. That never happened. For anyone who's taken the walk from the park on 50th Avenue, from Hunters Point Parks towards the number seven train station, crossing each street today, it doesn't seem to make any sense at all. You're on 50th Avenue with an east-west street that until the address changes were, was called 4th Street and even older West 4th Street. Why 4th? Because it was the fourth street up from Newtown Creek. Kind of making a little bit of sense, like if this engineer had looked at Manhattan and uh, when they did a grid for Manhattan, they didn't try to change all the street names in Greenwich Village and below to match a, a pipe dream grid. They left it alone and they used the grid for streets that hadn't yet been created. Now, keeping on that walk, the first street you cross is Second Street. But what happened to First Street? First Street is uh, a 45 minute bus ride away, or no, I'm sorry, a 26 minute bus ride away in Hallett's Point. How did First Street get to be in Hallett's Point and Second Street get to be in Hunters Point. Well, Hallett's Point is the furthest uh, outcropping of Queens into the East River. And that apparently was that engineer's uh, starting point for the new grid. The second street you cross is not Third Street or Fourth Street, it's Fifth Street. Where's second and third, where are third and fourth streets? They're back up in Hallett's Point again. Each uh, street is one block long. I'm sure that really helped development. Then you get to Vernon Boulevard, which was renamed from Vernon Avenue because uh, the engineer's rule said any avenue that crosses other avenues had to be renamed the Boulevard. Great idea, especially uh, considering the fact there was no Vernon anything in Queens anywhere else. You go one block more and you're at 11th Street, which in the, even in 1928, they had to put in parentheses East Avenue. That kind of made sense. It was the easternmost part of Hunter's Point and it was East Avenue going back to 1873. The next street is 21st Street. We jumped 10 more streets. In 1928, they had to put on the original name of 21st Street, Van Alst Avenue, so that people uh, would have some connection to what it was being called today. It was always Van Alst Avenue. Was calling it 21st Street helpful for anyone? I, what I have never seen in my research online or anywhere else are, is any data that would support that this address renumbering helped anybody. <laughs> I don't think so. And so are, I mean, so as you said, it goes from 11th to 21st. Do those num middle numbers in between exist? somewhere else, like up north also, or is it? Oh, yeah, the, he, this guy was partial to Astoria. Ah. You know, it, it, everybody looking and hearing us today, when, when you want a food delivery order, wh where do you say you live? Do you say you live in Queens? No, you don't. You say yeah. you live in Hunter's Point. 
you live in Astoria. Why? Because it doesn't matter if there were duplicate names of streets in other localities for Google Maps. It, it, it's totally absurd. And yet, uh, I tried to find my account with at the Con Edison website uh, when I first moved to 50th Avenue, and I couldn't find my address. And that's because Con Ed uses its own address system that they've never changed. And they say that my building is on 2nd Street. And the only entrance to that building is an exit door for Urban Market. And that is the mailing address, according to Con Ed. I had to have them put in an alternate address for me, 214 50th Avenue, so that I could actually find my account online. It really, this address changing uh, really didn't make any sense. And did it accomplish anything? Did it eliminate duplicate street names and numbers? No, it didn't. Today, there are four unconnected 56 roads in Queens, two different ones in Maspeth, one of which I lived on for 10 years, a three block long one along the uh, western border of Flushing Meadow Park, a one block 56 road in Bayside on which my son lives. Again, Vernon Avenue to Vernon Boulevard, uh, I'm sure that helped development. How about hyphenated building numbers where the new cross street is the first set of numbers and the new building number is the second set? Was that necessary or useful? You see online and these explanations or justifications for the address change saying that USPS prefers it to non-hyphenated building numbers, but no, it doesn't. Enter a hyphenated building number at a USPS address verification site, and it will correct it to a non-hyphenated address. The best advice to find a Queens address, it always was ask a Queens native today Google it. Yeah. And and just so, you know, ever, people who are familiar with the Hunter's Point neighborhood are also probably familiar with the fact that there are, you know, several different numbered streets that are the same, like 47th Road, then 47th Avenue, and then you have, 40, you have three 44s, uh, 44th Drive, Road, and Avenue. Is that because, like, they, they were, you know, numbered first and then more roads happened, or was that part of the plan from the beginning? It, it, that also seems oh. like it obviously doesn't make any sense. Originally, the street names made sense. They were numbered going from uh, south to north, going higher up. When they changed them uh, to uh, numbers that had nothing to do with the location, they had a, a sequence of uh, street names from uh, road to drive to lane, whatever that you had to follow. And I don't understand how that was any more helpful than having uh, uh, numbered streets that made sense or named streets that were different. Uh, it just uh, it, it doesn't make any sense to me now. And again, I think this was a pipe dream of Queens County bureaucrats. Wow. So Newtown Creek, the southern boundary of Long Island City uh, in the 20th century became not only uh, a very busy commercial uh, waterway, but it also became a commercial sewer, the site of a major oil spill, and a spark to community activism. By 1910, Newtown Creek was the busiest waterway of its size in the world, with 70 businesses handling copper, ore, and ingots, petroleum, lumber, coal, chemicals, and building materials. It was a, a major shipping hub in the Northeast. The creek was widened and deepened to accommodate bigger barges. The Merchants Association of New York in 1921 created a, uh, a flyer 
uh, for what they call the Newtown Creek Industrial District. And you notice it includes uh, Long Island City, Hunters Point specifically, to try to get even more businesses to locate along the creek. Here's a picture from 1921 of the southernmost point of Hunters Point with the Metropolitan Insurance Tower of Madison Square in the background. And it was opposite important business centers of Manhattan. Well, by 1978, a Coast Guard helicopter on routine patrol saw a plume of oil flowing in Newtown Creek. It wasn't so much a spill as a uh, over 50 acres, but a 120 year old leak from the refineries and the storage tanks. But nothing was done. This, again, it was identified in 1978. Nothing was even done to start to clean up 30 million gallons of oil, a spill larger than the Exxon Valdez until 1990. It led to the creation of the Newtown Creek Alliance, and their mission is to reveal, restore, and revitalize Newtown Creek and the surrounding communities, including Long Island City, through supporting ecological and industrial resilience. The initial group was uh, uh, people in Greenpoint, um, and as one of their first projects, the Alliance working alongside Hudson River Keeper Group and a local congressman's office filed a lawsuit against Exxon Mobil because they weren't doing anything to clean up the oil. And it's not just oil. And this is a contemporary photograph at just one location on Newtown Creek. Anytime it rains more than about a quarter of an inch, 570,000 gallons of raw sewage are dumped into Newtown Creek. There are dozens of other spots along the waterway where raw sewage is released. A few of these spew excrement far more frequently and in greater quantities. The EPA has decided that Newtown Creek commercial uh, companies and the people living near the creek can live with uh, a sewage system that still works this way. In 2021, the Alliance's work is, starts to pay off and we'll see that in the next episode. And finally, East River shoreline and residential park development and Again, based on what you've heard earlier in this episode, there was less and less need to develop the, the shoreline of Hunters Point as the uh, need for the ferries uh, was eliminated by tunnels and bridges. But in 1983, finally, the Port Authority announced a new development along what they called the abandoned and underused industrial waterfront, much of it brownfield land, and that's previously developed land, not currently in use, that may be contaminated. And that new development included an area where a quarter of the land was underwater, and that includes today's Center Boulevard. Six years later, Port Authority had only negotiated purchase of about a third of the necessary land from the landowners. The proposals for the waterfront development kept changing. Finally, there was a Queen's master plan of three office towers, a hotel, we don't know whatever happened to the hotel, apartments, 28 acres of waterfront space, which would be developed incrementally. The project's first construction was the Hunters Point Community Park on the south side of 48th Avenue between 5th Street and Vernon Boulevard. And it was, that was the first construction partially because the developers wanted to convince HUD 
to provide funding for the first apartment buildings and HUD would only provide that funding if there were guaranteed amenities for the people who'd live in the apartments. Finally, in 1998, Gantry Plaza State Park opened and almost immediately a group of concerned citizens formed a nonprofit called the Friends of Gantry Plaza State Park, the precursor to the Hunters Point Parks Conservancy with its mission to enhance the quality of life in Long Island City by promoting awareness of, concern for, and participation in the publicly accessible green and open space in the neighborhood and along the waterfront. And I'm gonna end with the iconic image of the Pepsi-Cola sign. Everything began with that sign in 1937 with Pepsi-Cola, which already had multiple buildings in Long Island City purchased three land lots on the East River from Mobile Oil. They wanted to expand its Queens operation. They put up a sign in 1940 at a time when uh, regulations were not too specific about how big signs could be on buildings. And a lot of concerns in Long Island City put big signs on the top of their building so that they could be seen from Manhattan, from the Queensboro Bridge, the Long Island Railroad, and elevated New York City subway lines. In December 92, the original sign was almost destroyed by a nor'easter and a replacement resembling the original was installed. In 2000, the end of the 20th century, Pepsi announced it would close the plant and consolidate all its buildings in College Point. The site of the Pepsi-Cola bottling plant would become part of Gantry Plaza State Park, and the sign would be moved about 300 feet downriver. So thank you for joining us for part four. I hope you'll join us for part five of Hunters Point Long Island City Through the Ages. We'll be talking about the 21st century, the future of Hunters Point Parks, and I'll be touching on, on a possible new Astoria Long Island City to Brooklyn trolley line. Big news and a cleaned up and restored Newtown Creek. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. And it's and it's great. You can see, you know, I like that you ended with this touching on uh, Gantry Plaza State Park a bit there, um, and the redevelopment of, of the waterfront parks because you know, it started, like you said, you know, Port Authority back in the '80s. But kind of that vision is sort of still going, still being developed. Um, obviously, different than what it was originally planned, but we're still kind of in the process of of that. Um, you know, waterfront revitalization of, of uh, the neighborhood. So um, thanks again and appreciate your little teaser for next week as well. Um, and I hope, I hope, like you said, that you can join us in chapter five. If you want to learn anything more about the Hunters Point Parks Conservancy and our work, uh, you can look us up online at HuntersPointParks.org. Um, feel free to uh, write to us at info at HuntersPointParks.org if you have any questions about these videos. Um, thanks and have a great day.